Okay, this is Planet of the Humans Part 3 discussion, and I just skipped ahead. I watched it, but I decided to start at the end of it because they were discussing for about 10 minutes. Philosophy and not being able to fix this stuff that I wanted to, I wanted to make this a They claim they're just using forest residues, but actually a great deal of what the McNeil facility and lots of facilities burn is full of trees. As you can see by this pile that's stacked right outside of the facility, these are trees. It turns out that the biggest source of green energy in Vermont is something called biomass, burning trees to create electricity. This is definitely not the way. And that the first step is actually looking at our lifestyles and how we can reduce our energy consumption. This is all the ash that has varying levels of toxic metals, great deal of radiation. This is these trees have been absorbed. So a... oh. You're in unforbidden territory here. Are we? They ask both of you to come up for a Okay. Is that something you're interested in doing? Yeah? It's not an interest. You've got five seconds or I'm calling 911. Okay. You've got uh, two individuals here. Uh, police will be down here in, in about two minutes. So you asked us to leave and we're doing so. I'm not asking you to leave. Thing. I'm asking you to come up to the office. Okay. Thanks for the offer. Maybe next time. You got everything here. So you have the number one polluter in the state that people think emits magical fairy dust from the smokestack. The reality is what you have is a facility that burns 400,000 green tons a year of trees. Now, this facility burns 30 cords of wood per hour. That's a hell of a lot. And on top of that, it actually burns natural gas as well. And to think you to truck them in to use the big machinery to dump the wood chips everywhere. So the idea that somehow this is not anything to do with fossil fuels just doesn't even make any sense. It's, it couldn't happen without fossil fuels. How did the environmental groups get pulled into this? I think the main factor is delusion. I don't think burning wood counts as fossil fuel. I mean, it emits carbon emissions. Burning anything emits carbon emissions. And we've been burning wood since the beginning of fire. Since the beginning just keep warm. So I don't think that as, as long as they're not destroying all the trees in the whole state, I think we need to focus on polluting the planet less more than we do stopping people from burning wood because that's like the most basic way to keep warm. Once we cut them, they'll grow back. They'll grow back over a period of decades to centuries. But if we cut every tree in the United States, it would be able to power the country for a year. You know, and then what happens when, you know, the, the trees are gone? I discovered biomass plants were not even always biomass plants. This is actually a solid waste incinerator that's posing as a biomass plant. The impact on this community is is severe. Um, it's Technically, if it's animal waste, it is bio waste. Like it's still not good. Good way to. It's not good to burn human or animal waste around people. I guess. Right next door. Oh, you know they're polluting. Can you see it? I can see it. Snow at the elementary school and at the at the preschool is covered with black, some kind of black soot. We just had it analyzed and it came back as um, mostly tire chips. They have to add tire derived fuel to raise the temperature of the fire because anybody who's trying to burn green wood or wet wood knows that it doesn't burn very well. But this biomass plant had yet another surprise. They admit that they burn 20.1 tons per hour of creosote treated railroad ties. Besides that
that they are allowed to burn 500 pounds per hour of PCP treated railroad ties. These are shipped in from Canada. It's not green, it's not renewable, it's not carbon neutral, it's not anything that they claim to be. Yet, they got $11.5 million grant because it was classified as renewable. The plant owner told us that they were having trouble getting uh, enough wood chips. And he even asked us if we had any scrap wood where, where we lived, would we call the plant to let them know so they could come up and pick it up? We're not talking about some old industrial site. We're next to one of the most beautiful places we in the world. We are next to Lake Superior. This is Keweenaw Bay. This is actually Lance Bay. It's part of Keweenaw Bay. It's um, Lake Superior, our lake. So it's a very sacred place. The lakes around Michigan have been polluted for so long that I wouldn't swim in it was me too. Oh, beloved Michigan. And thing with the protests this past week about the uh, pandemic rules that were under right now. The idiots went and protested there and the group that got themselves sick. It was But it turned out Michigan State had a form of green energy in mind the students did not support. The university contracted with a um, energy contracting company. They put together like a modeling tool. First like two or three months that the steering committee was using this modeling tool, it didn't even contain data for wind or solar. So there was... Adam told me they were planning on substituting coal burning with biomass burning. But the permit that is currently being considered by the state is a permit for um, 24,000 tons of biomass um, per year, I think per year. And the plan is to do that in all four, boil four boilers. Unfortunately, the steering committee considers biomass renewable at the moment, which um, we're not happy with. <laughs> Michigan State wasn't the only university to go green. I'm happy to announce that Carolina will be going beyond coal in the next decade. Now, as we begin to wean ourselves on coal, we're about to try another alternative energy source, biomass. And who is here to help the University of North Carolina switch from burning coal to burning trees? So it is a great pleasure to be here today to celebrate the remarkable step that the university is taking to say, we're gonna do our part. A remarkable step indeed. We're to do our part by getting out of bed with coal companies and into bed with logging companies? Where did the idea of colleges going green by burning trees come from anyway? A little college called Middlebury in the heart of Vermont. Welcome to the celebration of the opening of Middlebury's new biomass gasification system. It's now my, my great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Bill McKibben. What powers a learning community? And as of this afternoon, the easy answer to that is wood chips. Um, it's incredibly beautiful to stand over there and see that big bunker full of wood chips. You can put any kind of wood in, you know, oak, willow, whatever you want. Pretty much anything that burns, we can toss in there if we can chip it down to the right size. And there are very few similar cases any place in this country of that kind of change over that scale. But it shows it could happen anywhere, and it should happen anywhere. In fact, it must happen everywhere. It must happen everywhere. Okay, now that we know what biomass use is, I think my opinion is that um, and when it comes to coal versus coal and mining coal versus coal, I think, honestly, when it comes to carbon emissions and it is. I think burning trees is better. I mean, as long as you're not burning freaking tires and shit like that with it. But, um, I 
I think if they can, um, most trees don't take hundreds of years to grow, honestly. They take, um, I mean, when you're talking about the gigantic ones that they first cut down, like all the giant redwoods and shit that they were cutting down, not, not in this movie, in this country, they cut down, uh, they, they I mean, Trump started allowing, uh, deforestation in the f national parks, so they're cutting down like hundreds and thousands of year old trees. Um, but after, you know, you can grow tree farms like they do for Christmas trees, like, to use for farming. Um, and like I said in the beginning of the movie, you need to start somewhere to produce the energy needed to make wind, wind uh, turbines and solar panels. So if we are trying to stop the carbon emissions as much as possible, or slow down carbon emissions as much as possible, and use the cleanest burning energy, we kind of need to start there, switch to cleaner carbon emissions, cleaner burning energy, um, so that we can then create the resources that we need. Uh, I think that trying to get off of coal and fracking is kind of a good idea because you can blow up so many mountains and you can fracking so many countries are gone. And as long as we sure we have enough trees to clean the air and keep our air clean enough to breathe and filter out all the crap that we put into it, um, that's what we should make sure we do is keep enough trees around so we don't know. Like choke death, like they are in. But we should be still looking at the countries that are successful over and see how they did it. We don't do the same way. But this country has an, an extreme resistance to change, an extreme resistance to um, quitting something that's highly profitable. So. As long as things like solar panels and stuff are not yet profitable enough, they have no reason to start, you know, making solar panel farms. Um, so like I said, I think if enough people in the country started putting solar panels on their houses and stopped paying, you know, the, the power companies and the natural gas companies and all that, pretty soon they won't have enough profit to keep operating that way and they'll have to switch to the way that people are using now or using at the time which would be solar um so you know like it's, it takes the work we have to switch over we can't just snap our fingers and have our up here or everything turn into you know clean energy um we should focus on reducing our use of the most harmful uh, fuel sources first and reducing our use of plastic and reducing our water consumption because it's gonna run pretty soon but if we don't all start doing this right fucking now because it's already too late to stop like we don't all start doing this right now pretty soon we're not gonna have the time to switch over we're not gonna have the time to stop you know, we're, we're gonna run out before we can so uh, you know people need to start waking up I guess I'm just hoping I'm not around you know to see how much work I really don't want to see that. I found only one environmental leader willing to reject biomass and biofuels. So we are talking of the overall economy trying to maintain itself now with another raw material, the green planet. The only reason corn and soya is being planted for biofuel in this country is the subsidies to make it profitable. I think the big crisis of our times is our minds have been manipulated to give power to illusions. As we shift into measuring growth, not in terms of how life is enriched, but in terms of how life is destroyed. Her honesty was refreshing. But as for the rest of them, I wondered, what are they hiding? And why are they hiding it? Is it their ignorance? Or is it something else? What if they themselves had become misguided? What if they've made some kind of deal they shouldn't have made? And are leading us all 
off the cliff. It was long past time for me to come to grips with the other elephant in the living room. The profit motive. The only reason we've been force-fed the story, climate change plus renewables equals worse saved, is because billionaires, bankers, and corporations profit from it. And the reason we're not talking about overpopulation, consumption, and the suicide of economic growth is that would be bad for business, especially the cancerous form of capitalism that rules the world, now hiding under a cover of green. I hate capitalism and profit, of course, drives everything. Of $30 million in the Beyond Coal campaign. We have more, I'm glad to say that more than a dozen additional funders have committed to match that $30 million. And who were these new partners? One of them was Jeremy Grantham, billionaire, world's leading timber investment advisor. They were not investing in trees to turn them into nature preserves. Which might answer another riddle. Why is this name redacted on the Sierra Club's tax return? Would they be embarrassed to take $3 million from a man who made his living selling the forests of the world? Bloomberg bringing a timber investment billionaire to the party was no coincidence. Bloomberg sponsored a UN climate session to discuss wrapping up biomass and biofuels around the world. Billionaires were in love with the idea of turning what was left of nature into green. I remember when fracking was new and exciting and everybody said fracking was going to be clean and renewable and natural gas was clean and renewable and everybody wanted to switch to fracking and natural gas because that was the new healthy way to produce energy and then it became obvious that it wasn't because they don't care how they destroy the planet as long as they keep making money from it. Biofuels that required the consumption of the living planet. And it was game on for the airline industry. Dozens of researchers from all over the Northwest gathered in Missoula the past two days to explore the idea of converting the region's massive reserves of wood into jet fuel, especially with the demand for aircraft fuel expected to grow by a billion gallons in the Northwest alone. United Airlines will buy a $30 million stake in biofuel company Fulcrum Bioenergy. The airline I think we should ban private jets. That sounds like a good idea. What Silicon Valley billionaire Vinod Kosla hoping to profit from? Nature takes a million years to produce our crude oil. Kior can produce it in seconds. The company took over this old paper mill where logs are picked up by a giant claw, dropped into a shredder, and pulverized into wood chips. Clean. Green gasoline. green gasoline. There's there no, must be a downside. There is no downside. The bank that crashed the economy, ruined millions of lives, and has their tentacles on the levers of power. There's always a downside. One of the very interesting markets that we deal with in Brazil is unlike any other market in that today, alternative energy isn't really alternative energy. It's so much a part of the fabric of the society. The country began to, to utilize its vast resources of sugarcane to produce ethanol. There was a man from Goldman Sachs who was particularly in love with turning forests into profits. Has everybody got uh, enough coffee? You might want to get some more. Meet David Blood, former CEO of Asset Management for Goldman Sachs. How much money did Mr. Blood believe should be invested in green energy? Uh, a natural alignment for something in the order of 40 to 50 trillion dollars worth of capital. 40 to 50 trillion dollars. And who was going to help the man from Goldman Sachs? Help him raise that astronomical amount of money? A gentleman some of you may recognize and know, Bill McKibben. It's entirely dependent on what kind of political will we can muster. And if we do not get this done very fast, then we're not going to get it done. And so Bill McKibben went forth to generate the political will for trillions of dollars in green investments. Our next guest has been called our nation's leading... I'm gonna skip ahead a little. It gives incentives for people to 
do their best, Al Gore and David Blood partnered to form a company called Blood and Gore. No, scratch that. Generation Investment Management. And within this fund, Blood and Gore designated a special investment category, targeting $650 million of biomass and biofuels. Funny thing was, they partnered before Al Gore's film came out. Was that movie just about climate change? Or something else? On one side, we have gold bars. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Don't they look good? I'd just like to have some of those gold bars. Uh, on the other side of the scales, uh, the entire planet. <laughs> if we do the right thing, then we're going to create a lot of wealth. And when it came time for Al Gore to choose between the entire planet and getting him some of them gold bars, what choice did he make? Here is Al Gore earning his keep by pretending to care about the rainforest while lobbying Congress on behalf of the sugarcane ethanol industry. So any comment on the Brazilian effort here with the issue of the possibility of expanding into that Amazon River basin with further deforestation to produce more ethanol out of sugarcane is a worry, and I, apparently you're not as concerned about that. No, no, I, I am. I simply forgot. I think that was... monocultures in the region clashes with the indigenous people's right to land. These are images of a last-ditch attempt by the Wadani Kiowa to resist eviction. Important to note that the exploitation of the sugarcane growing areas in Brazil does not have to inevitably have the knock-on consequence of, of uh, causing destruction uh, in, in the Amazon. Sugarcane fields are burning. They're set alight before the harvest to eliminate the leaves and tops of the plant, which makes cutting more efficient. Environmentalists blame the seemingly endless sugarcane fields for air and water pollution on an epic scale. And along with deforestation, the threat it poses to the environment is becoming clear. Once the indigenous families were expelled, the landowners set their homes on fire. Is there anything too terrible to qualify as green energy? Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Mavis and the US Navy, for once again inviting me to speak with you today. The Navy's work to help launch this new fuels industry is invaluable. The U.S. Navy has a special message this year. It is time to turn green. Joining the vessels is what the U.S. Navy calls its great green fleet of warships powered by fuel from renewable sources like algae, grass, and animal fat. Animal fat. Oh, God. Horrible. Oh, fuck me. Oh, Next God. Time you fill up at your neighborhood gas station. You might find yourself pumping a little... Once we run through the animals, what's next? GE, who brings you nuclear energy and wind turbines, is ready with a plan. I believe that. Yeah, I don't know if I trust any giant corporations anyway in the decision. Through from sustainable raw materials. We believe that seaweed is one of the most attractive opportunities. Yeah, that's kind of limited too. After it was filmed, the seaweed forest was dead. Because of the way the oceans are changing from climate change. I ask yourself, how could men destroy what remains of nature to enrich themselves? <laughs> uh, 
I think they're painting Al Gore a little bit too harshly. Environmentalists are no longer resisting those with a profit motive, but collaborating with them. The Nature Conservancy... I think it's because they're in control of everything, so of course they have to collaborate with those who are in control of everything to start changing them. It's the same reason Bernie Sanders had to give in to spending his campaign Biden because he has no choice. But to create markets for electric cars. The Sierra Club sells electric cars and solar panels right from their I think using uh, cooking oil waste and stuff like that for is better than electric cars. Exxon Mobil to bring you the good news about biofuels. Algae derived fuel could help us meet growing demand. We don't have to harvest shit to make fuel. Use our waste. By Georgia Pacific, a logging company. In fact, they are neighbors. Georgia Pacific is owned by our friends, the Koch brothers, who are likely the largest recipient of green energy biomass subsidies in the United States. Yes, the merger of environmentalism and capitalism is now complete. But maybe it's always been complete. How is 350.org funded? Uh, well, not very well. <laughs> <laughs> Who are your funders? Not by the holy day itself. Happy Earth Day! <laughs> now we are facing the greatest sets of issues that we've seen in my lifetime. It's time now for a new generation to jump up on the stage and create a habitable country, a habitable planet that we can all enjoy. Are you that generation? Why should they clean up your mess? We've provided so much solar power to this that we've powered the entire event with solar energy. I'm sure. When I went backstage to see what was really going on. You ain't running this whole thing on that, Jack. I can tell you that. The toaster is 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 1,200 watts. So that run right there could run a toaster. I found the installer. Hi. I think that's slightly misleading, too, because there are houses that have probably four of those solar panels on their roofs and run their whole house with it. We'd also like to thank our incredible corporate sponsors who've been behind the movement to end extreme poverty and tackle climate change since the very beginning. We want to thank Toyota, <laughs> Citibank, <laughs> we want to thank Caterpillar. We're standing at the construction site of the Dakota Access Pipeline. It looks like there are at least three bulldozers actually bulldozing the land. <laughs> People have gone through the fence, the bulldozers are still going, and they're marching over the dirt mounds. Without these partners, it wouldn't be possible. Let's give them a round of applause, everyone. Another slightly misleading pit there. The machine doesn't. alone can begin to create the transformation. There is a way out of this. We humans must accept that infinite growth on a finite planet is suicide. We must accept that our human presence is already far beyond sustainability and all that that implies.
us. We must take control of our environmental movement and our future from billionaires and their permanent war on planet Earth. They are not our friends. Less must be the new more. And instead of climate change, we must at long last accept that it's not the carbon dioxide molecule destroying the planet. It's us. It's greed. And money. Thinking that money is not going to fix everything. A human-caused apocalypse. If we get ourselves under control, all things are possible. And if we don't, normal and acceptable is when we doomed every, everything because consumerism is the biggest evil consumerism creating all this plastic garbage that nobody needs and definitely nobody needs and most people don't even bother to buy and it's thrown away is the problem because all this fuel is needed to be created so we can pro process these plants, these factories that create all this garbage that we don't need. Like, I can't even wrap my head around how how many useless pieces of junk there are at the store, especially at places like the Dollar Store or Michael's or something. And imagine how every single product in the world has to be created in some factory somewhere. And if we had decided early on to stop creating shit that nobody needed and only create shit on, based on need, we wouldn't, have been, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. We wouldn't have this problem. I don't think the problem is population. I think the problem is creating shit that we don't need. Creating shit that is useless. Um, this, this, this problem... What are they doing to that poor monkey? Just put it out of its misery if you're not going to rescue it. Like, they they don't care about the wildlife. Like, they just destroy the, the wildlife homes and they don't care what happens to the actual wildlife. Just put it out of its misery. This is just disgusting. I don't, I don't understand. Like, I mean, some of these countries, they don't give a fuck about animals, but like, you know... At least put them out of their misery before you destroy the entire forest. But I think if we had just not started mass producing useless shit, then, then we wouldn't have gotten this bad off. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people and we need to stop having so many people in this world. But at the same time, like, we wouldn't have this much of a problem with um, needing so much fuel and needing so many resources if we didn't produce so much crap. Like, we don't need to produce all this plastic. We don't need so much plastic to make all these toys and all these useless gadgets out of. I mean, come on. That's That seemed like a more obvious solution than cutting down on um, you know, population growth. 
Like, you're talking about not having kids versus not creating junk out of plastic. Seems like that's a no-brainer to me. Um, it seems like whoever... I know I know the story of how plastics started becoming this, this the main uh, uh, material that we made shit out of. Because they... The, I think it was Nixon decided to... Uh, no, it wasn't Nixon. It was before Nixon. Um, one of the presidents before Nixon, I can't remember which, decided to forego hemp that would be used to make fabric, uh, seeds to make um, like food products with, um, wood, rope, uh, and, and cement can all be replaced with hemp, which can be easily grown, quickly grown, uh, replaced, you know, quickly can be farmed just like anything else. So I think when they decided to ban hemp and cannabis growth, uh, because they wanted to then move towards fossil fuels and plastic, that's when they fucked us. Like that's when they that's when they decided that making money off of oil and plastics was better than making money off of a renewable, grow up, easily grow up, flexible, uh, clean uh, products that we could use to make so much other stuff with. And once they made plastic, they realized they could make all these useless pieces of junk out of it. And that's, that's why we have so much plastic uh, pollution and waste. That's why we have so much need for all this fossil fuels, because oil is required to make plastic. And if we could just get rid of plastic, stop making plastic, make something else that's not toxic, that doesn't require oil to make it, that doesn't sit in the ground for decades before it degrades, like, it seems like a no-brainer to just stop producing all shit nobody buys, let alone nobody needs, you know? So, um, I think, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing my best is to not buy useless junk, to not buy as much plastic if I can help it. But then the other problem is that all the all the quote unquote uh, green items or renewable energy items or things that are made out of recyclable stuff are so much more expensive. Just like you know, organic food and, and fresh produce is so much more expensive than all the crap that I have to buy because it's cheap. So they have to also figure out a way to make it affordable to everybody because if I could buy hemp clothing, I would totally be doing that because that's really comfortable, really soft, it lasts longer, and it's easily recyclable. So, you know, it's it, another problem is the wealth inequality and the fact that everything that you should be buying is too expensive to buy for most people. So, just like, you know, electric cars and, and diesel cars are still too expensive. So it's like you, you you have to kind of tackle all these problems at once when it comes to making things because you can you can't make things that are only for ten percent of the population to buy, but you also have to stop making shit that everybody can afford, but that is completely useless and is going to be thrown away very very quickly. And the the fact that most companies have a profit create stuff that is going to break quickly as possible. Uh, case in point, Apple. They love to <laughs> they love to make phones that, that stop charging or die quickly enough that you have to replace it within a couple years because that's what they want you to do. And it seemed like we could have a smarter way of mining the precious material out of these phones that nobody uses anymore. And, and stop, you know, we could just use, reuse things a little bit more smart smartly and wisely we wouldn't have to mine for more shit and so i think the you know that's the answer start using our waste more new uh materials out of the earth and stop using plastic plastic, 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 plastic material we use uh, to make shit with right now so anyway i hope y'all are uh doing your best to do your part, but I know 
it's depressing because there's not nearly enough people trying to, you know, do what they can, and most people are just going to be too lazy. And until there's um, some kind of a law or some kind of a mass wide scale replacement of these things, we're not going to be able to do it. So hopefully, I mean, I have no reason to think it's going to get better with Biden, but. Uh, if we're lucky, you know, maybe he'll pick a VP that's going to be smart enough to run the show because he clearly can't. And hopefully we'll have somebody who's going to care more about the future than the profit because everybody else just cares about the profit right now. I mean, Bernie and AOC and maybe one or two other people in the government are the only people who are fighting right now for this. And as far as I'm concerned, you know... Some people who called themselves progressives are not really progressives and shouldn't be considered a progressive option. So you can think about that what you will, but I don't want to get into politics because i got to cut this short right now. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed watching the movie. Go make sure you watch it if you haven't because I kind of skipped ahead in some parts and I didn't show it all. But, um, yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments and I will do another video pretty quick uh, about other things that are happening right now. So stay tuned for that and hopefully I can get all these uploaded this weekend and you guys can watch them before you know, the pipe dies down or whatever. <laughs> this is my first time actually taking part in something. So I hope you guys are staying safe and not too bored and not too depressed and I hope we all come out okay on the other side of this. And I will see you guys in the next one. Peace out.